this is Grant. He's doing a live hey. uh, webcast. If you want to do an we are live right now. We are. We're live right now with the whole world. <laughs> At least it's accessible, right? It's just like your blog. You know that anyone could see it, whether they are or not. People might be watching. I think my husband is. is that I think he is. So you're from uh, Franklin, Tennessee. I am. My brother lives in Franklin, Tennessee. No way. Yes. Where about? Uh, Do you know? Uh, he just he just moved. I was going to give him an address, but I can't remember it. <laughs> like we'll just show up at his house one day. <laughs> hey, I met your brother. <laughs> he could be our neighbor. You never know. <laughs> he came over and started a, a church called Church of the City. His name is Darren Whitehead. Oh yeah, we visited there. My friends go there. Um, yeah. That's. Wow. I would say I know your brother, but I don't actually know him. You know of him. I know of him, yes. <laughs> so, uh, you are, well, I heard a little bit of your um, workshop today, and so uh, got a little bit of your story. Uh, are you sharing some of that tonight as well? What, what's the deal with you? Yeah, tonight is the deep dark secrets. and um, Now, I'll be sharing a part of my testimony, but really it's about how our, I know the theme is home, so it's kind of home is a place where you can speak freely, where you can be yourself, you can drop your guard, um, and we have home with God, uh, so we can be honest and vulnerable before Him, and we have home with others, uh, and that's just being open and honest with other people and community, and uh, just finding freedom within both of those those areas. So, and just kind of how God's done that in my life. Very nice. So you've written a couple of books. One one that I heard a little bit more about, is, um, which was um, Mad Church Disease. Uh, give us the uh, the back page of that one. Um, back page of that one, I was in ministry, I grew up a PK and said I would never burn out. My family burned out, it wasn't going to happen to me. And then two years in, I was really young, I was 24, um, ended up in a hospital, stressed because I was uh, just, just sick from it and I was doing things for God and in that process forgot how to be with God and uh, realized that working and serving in a church was actually doing more harm than good. So I needed to step away, realign that priority of my communion with God and then uh, get back on track. So it's kind of my journey through that, some things I've learned and then just some practical things for others not to burn out. Uh, are there any pictures of cows in there? <laughs> there are not pictures of cows. Um, the other book there might be though. There's some pictures in my and permission to speak freely. So <laughs> I was thinking uh, I was waiting for the PowerPoint slide when you're talking about the parallels with mad cow disease. I'm like, I want to see like some really angry looking <laughs> crazy looking cow. Attack. <laughs> and then it'd be like, and this is the parallel, this is what you could be like, right? Well, I will consider that for, I think I'm presenting that at a Shelby International Conference, so I, I'm professional, so I might, I might consider that. <laughs> Bring in the cow photos. Uh, so then you brought up your second book, P Permission to Speak Freely. Uh, what's the deal with that one? Um, that's kind of the basis for tonight's talk, is a, a little part of that, but it's just how by speaking freely, um, not only do we find freedom in that when we're open before God and others, but we give others that permission to speak up because if, say, you're struggling with something and you haven't been able to tell anyone and I kind of say, hey, you know what, I used to struggle or I am struggling with depression or anxiety, um, you might be like, oh, well, you went first and so that gave you permission to go. Um, I call it the gift of going second. So I went first. It makes it a little easier for someone else to go and how we can give that gift to people um, and show how God has worked through our lives and they can find freedom too. So That's brilliant. I was, uh, I was involved in running a Celebrate Recovery group mm -hmm. in Australia and that, that was one of those principles as well, particularly in the share groups yeah. where the, the leader always goes first and you kind of set the tone, right? Yeah. And so it's the same one-on-one -on -one in a conversation. You set the tone for the conversation, the, the vulnerability and stuff, right? Always leading by example. It's a, it's an adage, but it's true. So, um, so yeah, I, that's kind of the premise. And what's cool about that book, what makes it a little different, is I had people mail me in kind of their secrets, their things they couldn't, they felt like they couldn't talk about in the church. Um, that was the premise for it. Was I didn't feel like I could talk about some of the anxiety and depression that I was wrestling with in a church I worked at. And because I thought I'd be judged because there's a stigma, you know, oh, you don't have enough faith if you have anxiety. Uh, so I just said, what's one thing you feel like you can't talk about in the church? And it was a blog post and it just exploded. And people were sending me postcards. And so there's art that's woven into the book of people's confessions, people's secrets, kind of, of what they, they want to be free from. That's kind of their first step and then confessing it. 
So then we're looking forward to Lean On Me, uh, the next book to come out in September. And what's what can we expect from that? Um, first, can you sing the song? Uh, lean on me when you're... Okay. I just wanted to see if you do it. <laughs> um, so Lean On Me is about finding intentional and vulnerable community and, and truly a committed community where you're, you're covenanted with each other uh, and sharing the hard stuff. I went through a, a kind of tough season in my life in the last four years. I went through a divorce and chose to uh, embrace my, my friends and open up to them about the hurt and the, the pain that I was going through instead of running away from it. And with that intentionality, I just found so much of God. I felt like God was really far away for whatever reason in that season. But in hindsight, I can see how he used those friends in my life to carry me through that. Um, and the book was written. We didn't have a title for it. And that kind of came to my mind and my editor's mind. And uh, we read through the lyrics of the song. We're like, this is exactly what the book is about. So that kind of summarized it. So uh, it's actually a nice segue I wanted to talk about uh, sort of internet and technologies and stuff and uh, one of the things when I was uh, when I was googling your name was it the autocomplete came up with Emery Miller divorce mm -hmm. so uh, obviously that's not just that the people were trying to find out about that but you obviously must have been quite public or at least yeah. in part with that yeah. talk about that um, yeah it's uh, it happened very unexpectedly uh, for me and um, because I had had an internet presence that was pr pretty large at the time, um, they had walked through the people that read my blog that I had met on speaking engagements and conferences. Um, they knew my story. They knew who I was as a married person, the other half of that. So when it happened, um, I mean, it was probably seven months afterward is when I, I, I put up an announcement because I wasn't going to, I didn't have anything to hide. Um, but I felt like they needed to know the truth. And it was also kind of a, a farewell, kind of an indefinite farewell from the internet because I needed to go away and heal for a while. So I, I disappeared from online for a couple of years and that's when I was in that face-to-face -face intentional community. Um, and slowly kind of am easing, I will say still I am easing my way back in. Uh, it's weird to see that pop up because I, I get it on search terms and stuff, but I've also received emails from people that have gone through similar situations and they're finding hope and um, people were very, very gracious um, to me during that time, so. It's gonna be interesting now as we, uh, like what we do is run an online church basically and uh, and so one of the things that we do is, uh, is a Bible discussion um, webcast and so each week we, we pull out, we call it Gospel Stories and so we pull out a, a particular story of the Gospels and then we have four or five people just sit around panel discussion, kind of compare notes on it. People in the chat room are asking questions, making comments and that sort of stuff. What we're finding is that we, we get sort of uh, uh, academic or intellectual to start with, okay. but then when it gets to the, to the application of it, we kind of have all this open sharing and there's this, just this real community that's forming. So the interesting thing is, uh, there's almost these two parallels I see with you with with uh, you've got like this online community that's growing but then when you're talking about lean on me it's a lot of kind of face to face I'm really wrestling with is it possible to go at least part way online to that sort of you know that sort of connection that the deeper relationships is it possible to do that uh, not just face to face. What's your experience? Um, you actually stole the word I use because I've been asked that question a few times. Um, I think community is a weird word and it's really hard to define, but I think for certain what you can find online, you can find connection. And you can find and have relationships with people online that are very meaningful. Um, and a lot of times those come to face-to-face -face meetings, which is yeah. very amazing. I actually met my husband online, which is a whole other story. Yes. I thought online dating was the dumbest thing and right. um, ended meeting him that way. So, um, so I, but before we met in person, clearly we had a connection and we communicated and we spoke on the phone and we would email, I mean, just long letters to each other. So you can get to know someone that way and uh, encourage and pray for each other. But there's just something beautiful and sacred about seeing someone face to face. I think, you know, when, when Jesus came back to, uh, to earth and to his disciples and to the women, uh, the people that saw him after his resurrection, 
he came down in the flesh, you know, so like... Touch my side. <laughs> right, right, so it, there's a tangibility there. Um, and I, I have to think that it's the same, you know, like our... We're all united in our spirits through the Holy Spirit, you know, no matter if it's someone in Zimbabwe or here. Right. Um, but face to face, I don't know, there's just something really sacred and beautiful about it yeah. that... I haven't been able to find as rich of relationship in an online community until it comes face to face. Yeah, no, that's cool. I I heard a, an analogy of a of a one string guitar. So can the one string guitar make music? Absolutely, it can make music, right? right? But a six string guitar has just different elements or more elements to it. Online community is absolutely music. You know, like there's there's definitely things going on there, and then there's just more elements with a six string guitar. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting as we as we're living more and more of our lives online um, about deepening the connections. I think you know, and so I guess you would have lots of followers that feel as though they know you, but then who really knows you, right? <laughs> and I think that's true. in, in any relationship, we will reveal as much of ourselves as we want to online, offline. Uh, so what I may write online is is a one you know, very myopic view of, of who I am. Um, and not that it's any different than who I am in real life, but you you improvise. My husband's, husband's an improviser, so like you, you improvise because we're having this conversation, we're making it up on the spot, nothing's planned. I didn't plan this talk and have it proofread like I would a blog post, you know, it's just, we're talking. Um, but um, yeah, it, even though I, I could still hide myself from you, so um, yeah. I think in either arena we have to be cautious, um, not to air our dirty laundry one way or another, but just to share appropriately and in the right time and just have wisdom and discernment about it. Yeah, that's the challenge, isn't it? Being vulnerable in a place that might not be safe to be vulnerable, right? right? Yeah, you never know. And of course, you know, any blogger that writes anything vulnerable will get a comment that is hateful or hurtful and those come and, and they sting and you kind of have to learn to let them go. I uh, know it comes with the territory but uh, just know that people are finding help through whatever story they're telling. Uh, if they really are telling it in order to glorify God and, and bring honor to his name and what he's done in their life. It's not about them and their story, it's about what God has done with their story. Do you moderate your your comments? Do you delete comments and stuff? Um, I delete them if they're hurtful or offensive. offensive um, if they are hateful to myself or anyone else that's commented. Yeah. Um, but as far as uh, differing opinions um, or even right. criticism, it's yeah. I'm pretty open with it. <laughs> Free speech. Yeah. <laughs> God bless America. So there will be a few people watching tonight. Um, and uh, one of the things we're always talking about, we do uh, all, all of our big events that we do around the area, we live stream. And one of the things I always try to, to drive home is that God's presence is no thicker here or more evident here than it could be just at someone sitting in their computer at home, right? Um, but what, what is your prayer for an individual that's watching tonight? Um, I would just pray that I think we all struggle with something at any point in our life. The things I'll share about tonight, I don't struggle with anymore, um, praise God, but I still have struggles. And so whatever that, that present struggle is, um, whatever weight they're carrying around in their spirit, that they're able to begin the process of releasing that to God and sharing it with others and seeing the gifts that can come when, when you do share with others. Awesome. Well, I'll let you rest your voice. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> you Emery. Very nice. So there you go. That's just a glimpse of what we uh, get to look forward to for tonight. Emery will be speaking uh, during the meeting. Uh, we'll also have some uh, worship led by Jude St. Aim. And uh, the room is starting to fill up a little bit more. I want to check... Uh, never have it quite prepared that I want to check what uh, people are saying in the chat room. I'll pull that up right now. We're just uh, about 15 minutes away from the start of our, um, our session tonight. So let's see. Uh, just realized that I turned the wireless off and so that's not going to work. Let's see if it still does. Oh, it is. 
Got a few people on. Let's see who we've got on here. Hello to Donald and Kristen, Leslie and Mark, Regina and Willard. Nice to have you with us. Uh, glad that you can be watching. It's a great opportunity to send out to people online, uh, friends and, and uh, so forth, to say that this is uh, what's happening live tonight. And so uh, you can tune in not only yourself, but uh, to uh, influence your friends to do so also. To do so also. Can I say hello? Hello, sir. Hello. My name is Grant. Hello, Grant. My name is Cody Sinclair. It's Cody Sinclair. How are you? I'm very well. Now, you are a tall man. Yes. Yes, I am. How, how tall exactly? 6'9". <laughs> wow. So it's good that you're sitting down then. Yes, very. You might feel really short. Do you play basketball? No, but I really like mini golf instead. <laughs> it's, is something about the perspective that you can, you can see easier than where the ball is going to go? Yes, very much so. So you're seriously not into sport? No. Wow. Uh, what, I, what are you into? Um, I'm really into just learning. I like to learn. So. Where, uh, how is it that you've come to be here? Well, it's actually through my wonderful wife. Her family brought me to Christ. Nice. Yes. And uh, without them, I wouldn't be here today. Oh. And so it was, it was oh, tell us more about this. Let me get comfortable. Oh, this absolutely. sounds interesting. Uh, so how long ago was this? This was a year ago in August. So it's been over a year now. A year and a half, probably. But... Um, so, were you married? No. You, you've got to, you've, we've, got to, we've got to make sure that we get the story right, okay? Married, we got married on February 14th, so we almost had our one year anniversary. But we began kind of dating in August. Yes. I wouldn't date, I wouldn't give him a second look until he came to church with me. I said, well, I'm not going to date you, but you can come to church, you can sit in church with me. And so he came and sat with my family, and he kept coming and sitting with my family until he figured it out. <laughs> So, where did you meet? Super One? Yeah, Super uh, One's a grocery store. I in our, there. Yeah, in our, uh, we're from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yeah. So, in that northern area, we have Super One's. And uh, I came around, and that's where we met. And You were working the checkout? No, I was working the deli, and he came to hit on my coworker. Yeah, so I told her I was going to steal her boyfriend, and, you know, it just went really smooth from there. And now, I got him. <laughs> Now, one, one obstacle with the deli is how high that, that uh, thing can be, like the counter can be. No obstacle at all, right? No, no. And, and which helped for opposition, because all of, all of your uh, competition, you know, potential husbands, right, are all too short, you couldn't see any of them. This is a big advantage, I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pretty big advantage. Yes. Okay, so, uh, so then... You just kept coming back, finding reasons to go to the deli, right? Oh, yes. And then eventually, uh, she had invited me over to her house to make a fire for her little brothers so they could have s'mores. Nice. 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 So my parents could evaluate him, and they're like, perfect, you're going to marry him. I'm like, no. And they're like, perfect, he's got a job. So he got a job with my dad. My dad owns a painting company. <laughs> yeah, current job right now. Yeah. Still working for my dad. And then how we got involved with the Croc Center is we was we were involved um, just at going to church at the Croc Center um, in Coeur d'Alene. And then Chris Haas, he came up to us and just said, you know, will you guys pray about this? We, we need some help in the youth ministry. And we were both like, oh, God, no, please, not us. We, we don't do kids. And it has been the coolest experience. At first it was bumpy. It was like, we don't know what we're doing. We don't even like kids. And then it's like, we just kind of fell in love with it, and it was just like so cool to see God moving in in kids, mm -hmm. even if their parents don't even care about their salvation. They're just sending them to a place that'll take care of them for a couple hours, and it was just it's been really cool. And then Chris said, "Why don't you guys come to boot camp?" So yeah, and it's been a great learning experience from beginning to end. So did you did you grow up in the army? No, no, I. I grew up in a Christian home, 
um, very legalistic and I went rogue and I ran away from home at 14 and then the people that I call mom and dad now they actually took me in when I when I left my home and ran away and they took me in about about 14 15 years old and they've been raising me ever since and it's been really and they brought me to the Salvation Army they were a Salvation Army family yeah they had been going there since it opened and they just love it because it's so it's just about Jesus it's about the Bible they don't get into into uh, politics or legalism and it's cool we like that is that's all we're supposed to do we're supposed to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ and Keep it simple. The KISS methods. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> so, uh, did you start going to a Salvation Army Corps before the Croc Center? No, so it was just... Born and raised in Idaho. So, so But in the cro you, you started going to the Croc Center? As soon as it, as soon as it opened, okay. the, the Cross family who took me in, they had been going there. Okay. And, then, and then I started going there once I got there. So, how many years ago is that? Let's see. One, five, about five years ago, four or five. So do you still feel like you're catching up on Salvation Army lingo and that sort of stuff? Yeah. My gosh. I feel, especially coming to this, it's like, wow, so much stuff we didn't know. You know, even though we've been involved in the Croc Center a, a lot, we didn't know all the, all the stuff that went on behind the scenes. Like, how much responsibility everybody has and just the complexity of it. But it's been really cool being here and seeing and seeing all these people coming from all around for the same reason and that's Jesus and that's so cool. Very, very cool. Okay, so it was after coming and making the fire and all this sort of stuff, there was, was there talk of Jesus before any of this? Oh yes, it was, it was plain and simple from the beginning. Is, you don't get our daughter until you're a Christian. I had the ground rules laid in front of me right then and there. And uh, it was, it was a, a barrier for myself because I grew up in a non-Christian family whatsoever. For all of my life, we never went to church or even talked about it. It was just not my way of life. So I had to overcome that myself. And I'm so glad I did because life is so much better with, with the Lord. And. Uh, I am so very thankful for, for that family. <laughs> of course. Uh, what was your impression of God? What did you think of God growing up? Did you have an idea? Did you believe that there was a God? I always thought that there was something, but I could never place it. It was intangible, something that words wouldn't do. But there was always a feeling, an idea there but I could never put it past that. So it's interesting, you must have been at, at the church sometime, you know, in those, in those early few times, just thinking, how do, I, how do I just kind of do this so that I can get the girl? Do you know what I mean? Like, do, you, it must, yeah. I'll come to church for a while. Okay, I'll try this on. Oh, it, it got a hold of me. I wasn't just wearing it on. I was, it was inside of me at that point. Wow, that's really very cool. Um, and so uh, what, what's been the highlight uh, during this time for you guys? The what? The highlight. The highlight. Wow. Just the layers of, of constantly learning and finding new meanings and just seeing so many new doors open in my own life, in my, work, my, my walk with the Lord. Very, very cool. I, I would have to agree with that. Just like, it's been mind-blowing, and I didn't expect it to, to be honest. I thought, you know, I'm pretty aware of it all. I've grown up in a Christian family, but being here, it's like, wow. There's just all kinds of, you can always learn. There's always something to learn. God's Word is not a simple read. It's not just, you read it one time, and you're like, good, sweet on my way to heaven. I mean, there's so much we can learn. And having people that have discovered things we may not have, and that having them teach us and show us things is, is really amazing. And it's been really beneficial in our understanding that we need to grow our spiritual walk a whole lot more than what we think, what we think we're set. And you're never set. You can always learn. That's cool. Did you get to... Oh wow, there's a conga line going here. 
<laughs> There's a lot of craziness going on. Here you go. They're getting warmed up for the night, the last night. Um, did you catch any of the marriage um, talk? Jim Burns was really great. Yeah. He was just so blunt about things. It was like, well, I mean, there's no other way to talk about it. And it was really cool. It was just... It's great to hear it in a no-nonsense tone. Just, uh -huh. this is how it is, plain and simple. That's how it is. Now, that was really, really cool. I think that was one of our... Well, they're all, like, every time we went in and out of one, we're like, wow, that was amazing. Like, this was so cool. <laughs> there was never a time where we're like, oh, you know, that was okay. Right. We always took something away from each speaker. I think the speakers were fantastic. Yeah, Marco was Marco was brilliant. He was brilliant, too. So you feel like... You feel like you've probably got uh, a bunch of tools for all areas of your life, like your individual spiritual life and your marriage, and then for the youth work that you guys do and all that sort of stuff, right? Absolutely. It's been a great experience. Yeah, it's been very cool. It's been a very cool experience. Thank you so much. I'm glad I came over. And it was because you're so tall that I came and spoke to you <laughs> and discovered many more layers. <laughs> very nice. Thanks, guys. Wow. I'm, it's gonna uh, it's gonna start any moment, and so I'll get back and uh, and get ready. Isn't that interesting? The people that you meet, uh, everyone's got a story, you know. And so I'm sure that I could have, uh, you know, interviewed all sorts of different people about how it is that they've come to be here and their personal life and all sorts of stuff, and we'd find out interesting things. We um, we're about to get started. Let me uh, double check on the the chat room and see how uh, things are going here you can spread the word make it known that we are live right now and uh, what a fun little 30 minutes I just had got to speak to Anne-Marie oh whoa they had a dimming of the lights which means it's about to begin I'll get things set so you can hear the sound and uh, we'll cut across to uh, see the opening video as well. So here we go. Thanks everyone. Stick around and we'll talk again at the end. All right.
Live from Long Beach, California, it's the William Nelson Show with William Nelson. Tonight's guests, Aileen Bradley and Jackie Rail. And now, here's your host, William Nelson. Hi, I'm William Nelson. Today I have two pretty ladies in the studio to talk about Salvation Army programs. Jackie and Aileen are from Southern California and they are presidents of my fan club. <laughs> what type of programs does the Salvation Army offer? Well, for kids, they have programs like Sunbeams, Adventure Corps, Girl Guards, and then on Sundays, they have things like Junior Soldiers, and then you can even be a senior soldier when you're old enough. And when you're one of those young kids, and your boys, you have to be in moonbeams. That's true, there is moonbeams for little kids. Well, I was in moonbeams when I was younger. Did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. A little bit? A little bit. It was good. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you liked it a little bit. But is it is it true that they are creating a Minecraft badge for moonbeams? Mm, I haven't heard of that, but you know there is a make your own badge for Moonbeam, so any leader who wants to do a Minecraft badge can do one. Oh, like a creeper badge, like when you are like really good at sneaking and pranking and creeping on people, and you do it like in, during moon, when you do it during Moonbeams. I don't know if your leader would want you to be creeping around during Moonbeams, but if that's a badge, you can ask. <laughs> Like in, you're making creeper sounds from Minecraft when you're like, <laughs> Maybe that'll be one part of the badge, just you have to learn how to make creeper sounds. Okay. <laughs> Enough creeper sounds. <laughs> what kind of adventures happen? Bins on Adventure Corps? Well, whatever adventures that your leaders plan. When you go to camp, you can go out camping. You can see like oh. tracks in the ground. You can look at leaves in the forest. Oh. And when you're at church, you can actually build your own Pinewood Derby car. You can oh. learn about stuff about media. You can learn all kinds of things at Adventure Corps. Oh. Sounds pretty fun, right? And when you're Following tracks in the woods, make sure that they're not bear tracks. You might, they might follow. They might lead to a cave, and when you go in the cave, you would get mauled by a bear. Yeah, we like to avoid that Definitely. as much as possible. So if you see bear tracks, you should probably tell your leader. You don't want to get mauled by a bear. Yeah, it's one of the worst ways to die, to get mauled by a bear. I bet. I can imagine. <laughs> one, two. Oh, that one just did a 360 when it was going down. <laughs> Why should a core start using these programs? Well, they're great for kids. It's good for um, kids who don't actually go for, to a church. It's kind of nice and inviting. If Sunday's a little scary for them, they can come to a troops program, and they can earn badges, and it's just like uh, Girl Scouts, so it's something kind of familiar oh. for them. So it's kind of an easy outreach for any core to do to get uh, a lot of youth in their core. If you have sensitive skin, do you still recommend the Sunbeam program? I do. You know what? Sunbeams is for people even if they burn in the sun easily. They can still go to Sunbeams. Oh. Is that just a joke? I think it's just a joke, but it's a good one. Is the title of young adult an oxymoron? That's a really good question. What do you think? I don't know. I don't even know what's an oxymoron. An oxymoron is something where oh. two words that go next to each other kind of oh. counter the other one. So, like, you know how a shrimp is really small? Yeah. And you know how you can get jumbo shrimp? Yeah. So, it'd be like... 
how is a little shrimp really big? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's because like people think it's just like the part like that you eat is the whole shrimp. <laughs> the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, you only eat a little bit of it. You don't want to eat the tail. Why? Right? Because that's gross. I wouldn't eat the tail. It's crunchy. That's that a good question. That's young adult ministry. <laughs> it's do, it's actually wait. more of a paradox. <laughs> do you want to do a dance break with me? Yeah. Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> Do they slow dance at young adult retreats? Do they slow dance at young adult retreats? Yeah. Um, not on my watch. <laughs> um, <laughs> does that mean they don't? I hope not. <laughs> I don't know where they would do it. And I think they would do it in a secret room, in a secret disco room. Don't give them ideas. Yeah, yeah, seriously, don't, don't, give them ideas. Disco don't give them ideas. <laughs> They're, not supposed They're to over know. 18, but I mean, really. Should they have instant replay in Bible Bowl? I think that would be hilarious, yes. In slow motion? Yeah, maybe. But it's especially funny in slow motion? It would be funny in slow I motion. I think Bible Bowl sure. in slow motion. Bible like, is funny. Wait. Who led the Israelites across the across the Red Sea? That's a good question. Who did? Moses. Ding. ding exactly. Ding. Exactly. Just like that. Moses. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. That would be an instant replay. Good, good call. Which Harry Potter character do I remind you of? Who? Colin Creevy. I was gonna camera. say that. I was gonna say that. Colin Creevy. Are you girls dating anyone? Nope. Nope. When I turn 18, do you think I will have a chance? I think that you need to come and talk to us when you're 18 and see if you want to date a 40 year old. That's a good point. We're gonna be old. Gonna be really I don't old. think I would do that. Yeah. Ouch. That's okay. I understand. I'll be right. Thank you, ladies, and let's talk again in ten years. <laughs> and I don't actually think that will happen. <laughs> had a good day today? Yes? Before we get started tonight, I just wanted to see if you guys have been enjoying this fabulous worship team that we have. Tonight, I want to thank our worship team for all of their hard work they've put into this weekend and their talent that they're using to serve the Lord. And we just want to lift them up in prayer tonight because uh, their ministry is something that I know for me, who's non-musical and non-talented in that way, uh, really helps me focus on the Lord and really, you know, allows us to be in his presence in a special way with music. So we want to pray for Jude and his team up here. Uh, so would you join me in prayer for them? God, we thank you so much for the worship team. We thank you, God, that they come um, expecting to be blessed, but also to bless us with their music and their talents. And, and God, they're, they're very humble about it. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you that, you know, they all come from different places and they all come from different situations, but God, they're here because of one reason, and that's because they love you. So God, would you um, honor their time here? Would you bless them and, and their ministry of music? And God, we just pray that you would not um, allow us to get caught up in the music itself, God, but the reason why um, they do music, and that's to bring us into your presence. And so, God, we thank you for that, and we thank you for their gift. And now would you join with me in worship with the worship team? God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. 
you know, I actually just want to introduce these guys to you. You just let you know their name and stuff. Uh, they are they are a great group of people. Um, they they're just amazing. When you get a chance, just say thank you and keep keep praying for them. Uh, on guitar we have uh, Abraham. Uh, just give him a hand, please. Yeah. On drum, Redding. Give him a hand. McCormick. <laughs> on bass we have Eric. <laughs> on guitar we have Caleb. And of course the lovely Hannah singing for you. Just just give them a hand. Awesome. So we're going to sing a song I, I'm sure everybody here knows, right? You turn my morning into... Awesome. So that's easy. Let's just stand and worship together, all right? God is good. 
You know this one, you can sing with me. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. For out your power and love as we sing. Open the eyes, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Yeah. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. So 
what could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God. en español si pueden cantar conmigo este corito dice así yo sé que lo saben tu fidelidad es grande cántalo tu fidelidad incomparable Nadie como tú, bendito Dios, y grande es tu fidelidad. Otra vez, oh, tu fidelidad, tu fidelidad es grande. Tu voz, tu fidelidad, y tu fidelidad 
Oh Señor, tu fidelidad, incomparable, oh nadie como tú, bendito Dios, grande y grande es tu fidelidad. Cántalo otra vez, oh Señor y tu fidelidad es grande y tu fidelidad incomparable si hay nadie como tú bendito Dios grande es tu fidelidad y grande es tu fidelidad oh tu fidelidad y tu fidelidad es grande Incomparable es Y nadie como tú Bendito Dios Y grande es tu fidelidad con la voz es tu fidelidad, cántalo Y tu Let us take for granted your faithfulness. We love you, Lord, and we're here tonight for you. In your holy name we pray. Oramos en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amen. just came in last night, so I caught little bits and pieces of the YouTube stream before I left from my home in Nashville to come and got a little bit of Doug's message last night when I got here. Um, I, I've been talking with you guys just here and there as I've been here today, and my voice is actually a little shot because of that, so I appreciate that. You guys are great conversationalists, and you're very fun. Uh, and I've just been asking the question, what has been your favorite part of this week? And it's been really interesting to hear uh, a consistent theme throughout the entire thing. People are saying, I feel like I can rest. I, I feel like I can say no. I feel like, like I can breathe. It's, it's been relaxing. There's this sense of 
you can just kind of like kick your shoes off and put your feet up, which is what you do at home, right? And I thought, how, how should we end this week? With, with what you've heard so far from the speakers and in the chapel and in your labs and just in your conversations with each other that I've eavesdropped on. There was a group at Starbucks today. They are also in my breakout group. Um, I didn't point them out, but I eavesdropped on them a little bit, which was fun. Um, speakers are sneaky. Like, you guys didn't know who I was, and I'm just sitting there listening to you. You know who you are. Um, <laughs> but, but how do we cap off this week of, of home? And I, I just started thinking, what does home look like for me? What does it mean in its essence? And I realized it was a place where you can just speak freely, where you can be yourself and relax. And I have a couple pictures just so you can see what my home looks like. Um, I have a picture. This is my husband, Tim. We got married in March, so we're still technically newlyweds. Uh, he is at home with our sweet, our plus one puppy, um, little Miss Jasmine there. <laughs> I love my dog so much. Um, I, she's, she's watching right now. They're, they're watching. And I know she's probably hitting the computer screen. She does that. Um, so that's, that's home for me. I was trying to get a picture uh, from our wedding up on the PowerPoint. I didn't have time to do it. But if you go to my website, which is just my name, you'll see it. And it's a, a picture of me we're with the pastor on the beach. And we're getting married. It's a very beautiful moment. And I'm wiping my nose. I look like this in the picture. So the photographer was great. He captured the shot. And... Uh, that's home, though, the fact that we had just read our vows to each other. I was tearing up. I was emotional. And so I, I had to wipe my nose. That's reality. We got snot. Um, <laughs> and, and that's home where you can just relax, be yourself. And as I thought through this, I thought, what better way to end tonight than, than thinking about home with being ourselves with God and, and being ourselves with each other? With, with speaking freely to God and keeping this communication open, and then being honest and vulnerable with each other about the weights that we carry inside. You're ready to rest. You're ready to set some boundaries. You're ready to go home and, and put everything you've learned this week into practice, which is great. But there's this connection that you have to have with God, with your Father who is pursuing you, to start it all off, to get in that, that centered moment to begin it with. So when we mess up, when we do something wrong, or when we're going through a hard time, it is our nature to hide, right? You maybe have experienced an oh-no moment, where you've done something wrong, or you've said something wrong, and you feel this, this thing in the pit of your stomach, you're like, oh no, I can't tell anyone about this. Have we all experienced this moment, or am I the only one? Okay. So my very first oh no moment happened when I was a little girl. I was probably in the second or the third grade, and I grew up in West Texas. So think deserts um, with a little bit of farmland, some cotton. My closest friend, Stephanie, was a 20-minute tractor drive away. So her grandfather, Jerry, would come and pick me up in his tractor and drive across the field back to their house. Uh, no TV, really, for the most part. Uh, no radio. You could hit scan, and it just kind of goes, which I noticed it sort of does on the drive up here. It just goes and picks up little stuff here and there. Uh, so very remote, very, very boring. And my dad was the pastor of a Southern Baptist church in West Texas. So it's like a whole other breed of weirdness right there. So I'm a preacher's kid, which we'll explain a lot as we go out through the night. But uh, Southern Baptist, West Texas preacher's kid is, is kind of who I am. So you have this picture of the desert and my, my boring life with just my little brother and my friend Stephanie, that's kind of it. And it's after church on a Sunday, and my dad's doing the pastor thing and talking, and my mom is being a good pastor's wife and like waiting, and I am just hungry. I want to go home and eat my pot roast and take my nap. And that's kind of how I am today. I just want to eat and sleep. So that has not changed. But I'm bored. I'm playing around in the dirt because that's really, except for tumbleweeds, all we had. And playing around in the dirt, thinking, what can I do to like, bring some excitement and joy into my life? I look over here, and there's this sparkly blue Dodge Ram Charger. And the sparkly blue Dodge Ram Charger was given to our family by a wealthier man in the church, because West Texas Baptist pastor, you don't make any money. So rich oil guy, have a car, family. Great. So I thought, you know what would make that prettier? Is if I wrote my name in the paint using something, because you know, that's 
logical. Um, so I, I looked around, and we had like gravel roads. So that wouldn't work. But I reached up, and I had a hair clip in. So I got the hair clip. No one's watching. Go over, and I get down. And under the handle on the passenger side, write my name in cursive, because I had just learned cursive. Anne Marie. That's so pretty. That's not, that's scratched in the paint. Oh no, I am gonna get in so much trouble for this. And in Texas, we had paddles back then, like wooden paddles that, that was gonna happen if I got caught. And so I, for a moment, I thought, do I just confess? Do I, do I own up to this? No, are you kidding me? I'm, no. So you know what? My parents are tall. I am short. Maybe they won't even see it. So I just let it go. And we went home, and I had my pot roast and my nap, and it was good. And we went back to church on Sunday night, because that's what good Christians do. And no one said anything. And I thought, I got away with this. This is awesome. I'm in my room playing with toys or something. Here, knock on the door. And it's my dad. And being a Texas man, he folds his arm and mows he's in. Anne Marie? Yeah? Did you write your name in the paint on the car? No, I, I do not know of this thing that you speak of. <laughs> what? Really? Because it's, it's your name. And no, Dad, it, it was another kid in the church. People are always hating on the preacher's kids. I have been framed. It was not me. <laughs> that would be a good argument, except um, there's really not any other kids in the church, except your little brother. Well, duh, it was my little brother then. He's four. I don't think he can write his name, let alone your name, in cursive. <laughs> cursive. <sighs> I'm sorry, Dad. I just don't know who did it. And I went back to playing. My little heart just pitter-pattering in my chest. So he moseys over to my bookshelf, <coughs> takes down my favorite toy, which is a Care Bears tape recorder, places it on the ground. No. Before I continue with the story, keep in mind this is a three-dimensional Care Bears tape recorder, so their heads were kind of on the top and it was all cute and you could like play something and dub another tape here, so it was like this beautiful, beautiful toy. So he places it on the ground and, and his calm demeanor says, well, if you didn't write your name in the paint on the car, I didn't just do this. And he smashes my Care Bears tape recorder, y'all. Smashes it. So my little Care Bears head is like flying under my bed and springs are going everywhere and I'm just weeping and weeping and weeping. Daddy, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did it. I wrote my name in the paint on the card. I should have just told you. And he said, yeah, yeah, you should have. And he leaves. And here we are, 25 years later, and I'm still dramatized by this story. My counselor says, the more I say it, the better it gets. <laughs> Not true. But, but that to say is, is that was my home. <laughs> that was my home, my smashed up Care Bears tape recorder. And what we learn in our homes as we grow up is often what we carry with us in life, isn't it? So I have this picture of my dad, this towering 6'2 man with his size 11 cowboy boots, smashing that when I did something wrong. Boom, projection onto God. So when I do something wrong, I want to hide from God. But this doesn't just, it's not me, it goes all the way back to the very beginning of time, back to the garden with Adam and Eve. If you have your Bibles with you, or a Bible app of sorts, if you will turn or touch to, <laughs> I've never said that, that was fun, um, <laughs> Genesis 3, and we will start with verse 6. So this is right when the fall is about to happen. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves <laughs> loincloths. So right here, right in this moment, in these verses, this is this cosmic moment in time where fear and shame enter the world for the very first time. That's it. That's the moment. And instantly, if you look in the original translations and, and people that have studied this verse, as soon as they ate that fruit, it says immediately, the instant of, their eyes were open. And they realized that they were naked. They, they were ashamed and they sewed these loincloths together, these coverings with fig leaves, which were very big leaves. 
So instantly, when fear and shame entered the world, they wanted to cover themselves. They wanted to add separation between each other because they were ashamed, and also separation from God because they were ashamed. They had a really big oh no moment. So, so they cover themselves because they're naked, they're ashamed, they're hiding. And then in verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? This verse has got to be one of my favorite verses in the Bible because it shows us a beautiful picture of God's character. Where are you? He walked. He didn't run after them. He didn't wait till it was nighttime when it was really scary and they didn't have flashlights on their iPhones. It was totally dark. That's what I would have done. If I was God and my perfect creation had just sinned, I would have like sent Tyrannosaurus Rexes after them. Like, why did you sin? Rah! That's not what he did, and I will never do a dinosaur impression again, don't worry. That is not what God did. He walked in the garden in the cool of the day. Think of when the sun is setting here, when the sky turns pink and purple and blue, and it's this beautiful, beautiful thing, and it's peaceful, and you can look up and you can breathe, and for a moment you can sense God, and you're like, yes, I hear you. That's the moment when he chose to pursue them in their sin, in their brokenness. You see, it's in our nature to hide, but it is in God's nature to pursue. That's what he does. And he doesn't condemn them. He doesn't smash their care of his tape recorder. He just asks a question. <laughs> Trauma. Where are you? He knew what happened. He wasn't asking, Where, what bush are you under? I can't see you. Where are you? Where is your heart? I miss you. Something here has been disconnected. Where are you? Let's make this right. Where are you? And he, he being Adam, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Again, he's not condemning. He's not saying, Why did you do this? He's asking them to confess. He's asking them to come to him. So the man, Adam, said, the woman who you gave to be with me, <clears throat> she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman confesses. She says, well, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So there we have it, the exact same pattern that all of us follow when we screw up. We hide. We try and point a finger and figure out, it's, it's not me, this brokenness, it can't be me, it's got to be the way I grew up or what this person did to me or it's this other reason, it's not me. I did that, it's not me, it's, it's someone else in our church, it's my little brother, it's not me. But God says, I don't care, just come to me. Where are you? Let's fix this. There is no need to hide. He knows, he loves you, and he's pursuing you. And he wants to use this opportunity to teach others about him. I'm sure you're familiar with the story of David in the Bible. David was kind of the poster child for a lot of things. He was a man after God's own heart. He had this great relationship with God, and you can read through the Psalms, and you can read through his life and see how beautiful that relationship was. But he was also the poster child for being a royal screw-up. No pun intended. Royal screw-up. We know what he did. You got it. There we go. <laughs> I get it, it's like the last night, it's cool. So, so he messes up. He, he sees a woman bathing on top of a roof named Bathsheba. He wants her, he sends someone to get her. She comes, they have an affair, she gets pregnant. He does everything he can to hide his tracks, including getting Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed. David stays back, he hides, he doesn't own up to this at all. And as you're reading through the Psalms, you'll notice something. The Psalms that David penned, when they begin, they're like, rejoicing in the Lord, God is great, yay, like that kind of stuff. But once the sin happens, and he's living in his sin, and he's living in this, this hiddenness, and he's carrying this weight around, the Psalms kind of take a turn for the worse. It talks about, I, I feel, God, like you're piercing my bones. I, I feel like I want to die. All of my enemies are after me. Just, just let me die. This is horrible. And what we're hearing there is we're hearing the weight 
that sin. We're hearing the weight of that burden, that brokenness that has gone unconfessed. And so God sends a prophet named Nathan after David to have him confess. And Nathan confronts him and says, hey, David, this is my paraphrase, by the way. Hey, David, let me tell you a story. And David says, cool, I like stories. So Nathan says, there's this man, and he's very rich. He has everything he could ever want. He has, you know, all of the wives, and he has land, and he has cattle and flocks and just kingdom. He has everything, all the money in the land. And then there's this poor dude. And this poor guy, he has one thing, and it's this one little sheep, this one little ewe lamb. And a visitor comes to their village. And instead of the king throwing a party for the visitor and welcoming him, this, this king goes, and he takes the one little lamb from this man, and he slaughters that for the guest instead. And David, knowing the cultural, that, that's horrible. He's so furious at this that he tells Nathan, well, whoever this king guy is, like, he needs to pay the guy back times four, and he needs to die, because this is, this is just not right. And Nathan's like, you see, here's the thing, David. That guy, the bad guy in the story, that's you. What you've done, you have everything. You've sinned against God. And what you've done in secret will be brought into the light. And David's like, oh, okay. And he takes this moment and he confesses. He does. He repents before God with a clean heart. And if you look at Psalm 51, this is his, his confessional prayer from that sin. And there's a pattern that we see in Psalm 51 that I think is so important for us to learn what God can do with our brokenness. So Psalm 51, 2 says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That's the first part. Cleanse me from my sin. God, cleanse me from this, this weight, this burden, this shame that I have. And then in verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. So God, not only cleanse me, but restore me. What was broken in me, make whole again. Give me a new spirit. And then third... Then I will teach, in verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. So we see this pattern of cleanse me, God, restore me, God, and then I will teach others about you. And that's what God loves to do with our brokenness. That's what God loves to do with our stories. Because I would say probably most of us in here are, are kind of broken and screwed up in some way, right? All right, so this is where we go deep. So kind of like, whew, all the air out of the room. I get to share with you how God has done this in my life in an amazing way, how I've been cleansed, how I've been restored, and how now I can teach about how faithful he is and how good he is and the joy that he brings. So backtrack a little to that West Texas town and imagine a little sheltered me growing up. Baptist, conservative, don't talk about anything, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion, except your own, which is always right, no one else's is. And then you don't talk about sex. Those are three things, like forbidden rules of the Baptist, West Texas, preacher's family. So you don't talk about those things. When I was 16, my dad left the ministry, and it was a pretty ugly sort of event. It uh, wasn't, he didn't do anything bad. Uh, the church was going to split, so he resigned instead of it splitting, and it broke his heart. And the thing was, whoever got the best job, that's where we would move, because you can't live on anything in West Texas. So my mom got a job teaching in Dallas. And so we moved from this tiny town where my smallest class had like 16 people in it to Dallas, 5 million people, to a class of 800 almost in a school of 2,500. And I'm 16. And I'm just going through crazy culture shock. And I'm mad at God about what happened. I'm super angry at him. My dad is clearly very depressed and spending a lot of time withdrawn and in my parents' bedroom. That's kind of my snapshot of that year that I remember. It's just my dad in their bedroom. And my mom's working all the time just trying to keep our bills paid. So I go to school, and I'm like, wow, what do I what do, I do here? Um, I was a minority in my school where that was a big difference just culturally, and I'm 16. So, like, things are changing in my body, if you know what I mean. Awkward. Okay, so, so I, I'm lonely, and I'm scared, and I'm mad, and I thought, what do I do? Maybe I'll just play the role of the good preacher's kid. Even though I'm not really believing in God right now, it's what I know how to do best. So I went to the principal, hey, can I start a Bible study? Can I do a see you at the pole? Can I do all these things? Got the blessing from her. Okay, we're not going to church. So I got on AOL. This was in the mid-90s. So I get on AOL, dial up, search AOL profiles because it's the only thing you can do. Youth pastor, Arlington, Texas, 
look through some people. Oh, this guy goes to the seminary my parents went to. That's cool. Hey, I'm new to town. I need some help with like Bible study. Can you, can you get me some materials? He writes back, absolutely, let's meet up. There's a Walmart by your house. We can meet there because Walmart's clearly the best place to meet. So my mom was not going to let me to meet me some uh, creeper off the internet, even back in the 90s alone. So she drives me to the Walmart. I meet the youth pastor. He gets me the materials. All's good. Go back to school, try having this youth poll. No one shows up, and I didn't want to be like the only one out there with my boom box, rocking out DC talk, Jesus freak. <laughs> Still embarrassing when you're by yourself. Community is good, although one is sad. So didn't want to do that, so that was terrible. No one showed up for Bible study. And a couple weeks later, the youth pastor calls me, and he said, hey, how's it going? How's all these, how are these events going? And I said, um, not so good. No one's coming. And, you know, I was kind of done with the Jesus thing anyway, so I think this is just like the final straw. And he said, no, don't, don't give up on your faith yet. Just come over. Let's talk about this. Let's, let, we can pray. I'm like, all right. So I drove to his house, and he let me in. And talking about Jesus was not on his mind. And for the next six months, he sexually abused me. And I didn't really even know all of what was happening because I had never had the talk with my parents. I mean, I, I picked up on things here and there, and you get the little school class thing, but I was just kind of confused. I knew what we were doing was wrong, but I felt affirmation at the same time, so I thought we were dating, and he was just 10 years older than me, so it's not that big of a difference. And I felt, you know, I'm 16, I'm mature, but I didn't realize at the time he was taking advantage of me. But I was more curious about what was happening, and I was not about to ask my parents, because you don't want to get the youth pastor in trouble, number one. You don't want to get any pastor in trouble. It's the lie I was believing. So I waited till they went to bed one night, and on that same computer that I looked him up, I just typed in with complete innocent intent, S-E-X, enter, because I just needed to know. I just needed to have some sort of answers, and I couldn't ask anyone at school because I'd be too embarrassed. Couldn't ask my parents. So I learned what I needed to know, pretty easy. But what I started seeing come out, the images, the videos, the chat rooms even back then, somehow by looking at pornography online, I was finding medication for my soul. I don't know why, but for a moment anyway, it helped. It helped numb the pain of moving far away from all of my friends and being in a new town, from my dad's withdrawal, from the shame I was carrying, from what was happening with the youth pastor. It numbed it. And then I stopped, and then I would feel worse. But then I would return, do it again, and the cycle continued, and I could not tell anyone about this. Because you hear about guys in porn, and that's like a common thing. I won't say it's normal, but it's common. But you never hear about girls in porn, especially some 16-year-old preacher's kid. Who could I tell? Nobody. So I went farther away in my faith. I started acting out more of what I was learning online in real life. And I hated myself for it. I was so ashamed. The weight was so heavy. I understand what David meant when he said, I feel like my bones are breaking. Why can't I just die because of that, that burden and that shame? So I moved when I was 21, five years later, to Kansas City. And I met a friend. Uh, her name was Christy. And one day we were just hanging out. And she has no idea. No one has any idea this is happening. I have this perfect life, and then I have my secret. So Christy and I are painting our toenails one Saturday night in the bathroom. And she looks at me, and she gets all serious. And she said, can I share my story with you? And I thought, that is a weird way to ask a friend a question. I said, did you kill someone or something? Because you're acting really weird right now. And she said, no, I didn't kill anyone. But it's, it's pretty bad. Mm. Well, of course I want to know. <laughs> of course. Please tell me your story. You're my friend. I'm not going to judge you. So she begins to tell me how she was in an abusive relationship before and how she was looking at porn and doing all these other things that I struggled with that I had never had heard another person talk about. And she's crying, and I know I look freak out because I've never heard anyone verbalize these things before. So she sees the expression on my face, and she said, I'm so sorry. If you don't want to be my friend anymore, I understand. If you think I'm some weirdo pervert freak, I understand. I think I'm some weird pervert freak, so I get it. And I said, Christy, no. That's not it at all. What, what you said... That's me too. In, in most ways, that's my story. Can I, can I share my story with you? 
And I told her. I told her about their relationship with the youth pastor, and I told her about looking at porn and the, the lustful things that I was doing, and, and it all just kind of came out, and we were crying and hugging each other. And in that moment, something sacred happened. This, this weight was lifted. In James 5.16, there's a verse that, I know I said Genesis 3 was like my favorite verse, but it's not. I have a lot of favorite verses. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. What I love about this verse where it says that you may be healed, that phrase right there. Earlier in the passage, he's talking about physical healing. If you're sick, reach out to the elders, be anointed, and be healed. But this word healed in the original text means a weight that's in your spirit that's been lifted and bound and released. So it is a spiritual healing. So when you confess your sins one to another, when you talk about your faults in community with another believer, that this secret mystical uniting of your spirit through the, the Holy Spirit, this amazing thing happens. And you, you've heard the expression, I've got to get this off my chest. We didn't make that up. That's what this verse is saying. When we talk about our sins with each other, our weights, our burdens, our secrets, the shame, whatever happened to us, whatever we're doing, whatever that brokenness is, when we confess it to one another, that weight is lifted. It is removed. And in that bathroom, as we were painting our toenails that night, that weight was lifted and removed from my heart and from Christy's heart. And we weren't healed instantly. It's not like the temptation just went away. But we became these solid friends and we put plans in place, and we sought counsel, and we became accountable to each other, not in that fake accountability sort of way, but in that covenant kind of way. And you fast forward through a couple of years, and it's gone. We are free. We are free not just from the temptation of what we were doing, but we are free from the shame that we were carrying around too. Christy gave me a gift that night. She gave me the gift of going second because she went first. It is always harder to go first. It's always harder to speak those awkward words into this invisible space and not know how they're going to be received or someone on the other side is going to judge you. But guess what? They don't have the right to judge you. Check out Romans 3. You can learn all about it. It's there. No one on the face of this earth can judge you or condemn you. That's God's job. But hey, Jesus took care of that on the cross. So when you confess it, you're good. If they judge you, they got to deal with that. But it's hard. I get that. But when you go first... You let the other person on that side of the confession know that you are a safe place. You let them know that you are home because you have the Holy Spirit living in you and you are not a place and you are broken and he is working in you. You are home for them. She gave me the gift of going second. And what's cool with this story, if you think about with David, cleanse, restore, teach. So cleanse, restore, teach. Then it's my job now. It's my job to give someone else this gift. And I didn't know when or how it was going to happen or that it was even going to happen. But a couple of years later, I was working in a church. The girl who had shunned God, had sworn him off, was now wrapped back up into his love, and I was working in a church. I was in student ministry. I was the girl on staff, which meant I did everything except preach, and we were having a lock-in for the students. That was a little knock to the denomination, whatever. So we're having a lock-in for the students, and I'm going around making sure like no one's making out and that sort of thing. And I walk into the gym where this, this concert is happening for the students, and it was just like God had sent this lightning bolt through that gym and just, Poof! you need to go talk to this girl over here. And I looked, and there's a girl sitting over here by herself. You need to go talk to her about porn. I'm sorry, God, did you just say porn with a P? or corn with a C, because I'm pretty sure you don't want me to talk about that. That's awkward, and she's a student, and like I could probably get fired. I don't know. That's just, no. And he's like, no. In fact, right now, this is a very big moment in your life. I'm gifting you with the spiritual gift of awkwardness. <laughs> now, can I get an amen? Because that is a gift that people don't recognize. Does anyone else have the spiritual gift of awkwardness in this room? Amen. So I'm like, okay, I can be awkward, that's fine. So you guys know that by now, so it's probably not that much of a surprise. But I walk over to this girl, and I'm, I'm sweating, and I'm nervous, and I don't know, how do you start this conversation with a girl you don't really know at a rock concert for high school students? So that band was really good. Uh, Want to hear about how I looked at porn? <laughs> creepy! Like, oh my gosh, it's so creepy. So 
but that's what I did. I go and I sit by her, and I look up on the stage, and it was like an angel of the Lord had appeared on the stage because there was this guy, and he was breaking down the drum cage, and he had this T-shirt on, and it said xxxchurch.com, triple xchurch.com across it. I knew what that was because I had the software on my computer. It, it's like a software reporting thing for bad sites. And I was like, hey, Crystal, see that guy up there, the xxxchurch.com? She said, yeah, what, what is that? Is that like a porn church? I'm like, <laughs> no, silly. It's where people go to get help, and they have porn addictions, and it gives you resources, and you know, it's, Christians can find help there. And she's like, Christians look at porn? This is not going well. No stopping now. Yeah, Christians, it's not like we want to look at porn, but hey, can I tell you my story? So I told her my story. And she looks at me, just like deer in the headlights look. I expected a little something different, like she would fall on the floor and cry and repent and weep because that was her. Like, oh, it's me too, I'm set free. Oh, thank you for talking. No, she's just like. And I said, so my friend Christy and I have this group and we're asking other girls to join and talk about the hard stuff. You want to join? Yeah, that's fine. Are you kidding me? Did I like not have a good quiet time today? Like, did I misunderstand something? What is happening? Okay, cool. Well, I guess I'll email you or something. This is so bad. So the next band goes up and they're playing, and it's this emo band. And the lead singer is really cute, and he has hipster glasses even before they were cool. And the girls are just like, oh, Steve, we love you. You're so cute. And Crystal's crying, and all the girls are crying. I'm like, Yep, that's about right. So um, I'm just thinking how I should apologize to her after the band is done. But he finishes this song, and it's about silence. And the last bit of it is, the silence is killing me. And he's just like, the silence is killing me. The silence is killing me too, Steve. <laughs> For real. For real. That's what's happening and what I thought was this come to Jesus moment. And so Crystal is just like bawling. I'm like, ugh. It's okay, it's okay. And they get off the stage and she grabs me. She pulls me in and starts just like ugly crying on my shoulder. And I'm like, wow, this is what's happening here. This band must be really good. Maybe I need to change my taste a little bit. And she finally catches her breath. And she stops and she said, what you said about Christians and porn, I was lying. That's me too. I saw my brother's Playboy when I was 10. I'm 18 now and I haven't been able to stop. I've even looked at it at school and at work. Yeah, I need help. And she starts crying again. I'm like, oh, wow. So Christy gave me the gift of going second. I gave Crystal the gift of going second. Crystal gets in counseling. She gets healthy. 10 years later, present day, Crystal has a ministry called Whole Women's Ministries that reaches thousands and thousands and thousands of women who are trying to be, find freedom from sexual abuse, from addiction, from any kind of shame that they're carrying around. That's her ministry now. So when Christy gave me the gift of going second, I gave Crystal the gift of going second. Crystal gave all these women the gift of going second. I end up in Davenport, Iowa, marrying my husband, Tim. Uh, through him, I meet this girl who's 19, and I meet her in a book submillion, and she is reading Crystal's book, because Crystal wrote a book about it. And I'm like, whoa, this is crazy, like worlds are colliding. So I befriend this 19-year-old girl, and, and she talks about her addiction. She goes into this kind of treatment place for a little while, because she's been addicted to it since she was 11, and I could go on and on about how younger and younger, younger kids are getting exposed to porn and addicted to it. It's frightening, but she saw it when she was 11, um, she gets some healing and some help. She's now leading a junior high girls group and talking to them about this stuff inappropriately, but, but helping them through and navigate these waters. So, so she's giving this gift. It's just crazy how God will take the most broken, the most shameful, the most ugly part of our life and use it and cleanse us from it first, restore it so there's not even a piece in us broken, and then we use it to teach others about his glory. And people get set free. It's amazing, and there's so much joy, and there's so much freedom, and that, when you can speak freely, when you can say, this is the ugly part of me, the part that I am not proud of, but oh my goodness, look what God has done in my life, look how he has redeemed this, that is the home that we need to go to. Amen. That is the gift that we need to give the world, because you see, I know if you're in this room, you have a heart for serving people, that's apparent, and from everyone I've spoken to today, I can just see that radiate off of you. So we are to be the light into this world. And people look at Christians or people look at, at people that, that claim to know Christ 
and they say, look at those hypocrites. Like, that's the statistical evidence is that when non-believers look at believers, they say we're hypocrites. It's one of our defining definitions. Because we pretend like we have everything together. We pretend like we have everything figured out when we don't. And then when we screw up, which we do, boom, we're hypocrites. But instead, if we don't pretend like we have everything together, we don't pretend like everything is fine anymore, we're saying, I'm broken, I need Jesus, they see hope. Not hypocrite, hope. Amen. So I'm not saying air all of your dirty laundry. There is not ever a time and place for that. But my goodness, acknowledge that brokenness. Ask God, hey, where are you? I'm right here and I need your help, buddy. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for cleansing me, restoring me. Now, God, give me a platform to teach this from. Let me show people how you restored me. And we don't need to hide from others. It's hard. It's so hard to confess. If it's a sin, if it's something that happened to you in your past, if it's a question you have, if it's something you're struggling with now, whatever that weight is, we all have a weight. At any point in our time in life, we have a weight. And to open up to another person, just one person, to find that courage and say, hey, can I tell you my story? Not only will you find a gift of freedom, that weight will be lifted and removed and bound up, bound up tight, far, thrown far away from you. But they're going to get that gift as well. And it will continue. It may not be thousands of women like how Crystal's doing it, but that doesn't matter. God, God doesn't look at numbers and go, oh, that's a thousand people. Check, Crystal's doing good. He doesn't care. He just wants your story and his story of redemption to collide and be shared. Amen. That is home. And that is the place I feel like I need to call you to tonight. As we start wrapping this thing up, I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to head back into a time of reflection. But I want you to think, you and only you know that spot. You and only you know what fig leaves you have covering something, where you're putting distance maybe between you and God, and maybe where you're putting distance between you and another person. Because you're ashamed, you're hiding, and you're scared and that's okay. We all are there. You're not alone in this. But think of that place. And it is my prayer. God put this heavy on my heart as I was preparing this this afternoon, that, that there is freedom for you guys, that before you can go home, before you can go back into the daily grind of whatever it is that you do, that you need to come to him and find rest. Home with God in the shadow of his wing. Just go in that protection just close your eyes and imagine being wrapped up in him and him just holding you, saying you are cleansed, you are restored, and you are healed. You are my child. Your identity is not in that shame. It is not in that pain. It is not in that sin. Your identity is in me and me alone. That is what he's telling you. That is the truth. And think of what that freedom looks like. And whatever it is, tonight is the night. I please, please do not go home and continue doing what you've been doing. Tonight is the night that you need to let this go, to let God continue his transforming work in you because you have already been saved, you have already been rescued. It is a transformational process. So you confess and that's the beginning of this transformation. Then you allow him to work in you. So as the band plays, however the spirit moves you, if you need to come up here to this altar and cry and pray and kneel and get on your face before God and say, God, here I am and I need you, do that. If you need to grab someone, grab your DYS, grab whoever is around you that you know that you feel safe with, or if you don't know anyone, just grab someone. I think everyone in here can be a safe place tonight and say, hey, I need to, t I need to get this off my chest. Can I tell you my story? Can I tell you my hurt? Can I tell you my brokenness? Please do not leave here, do not leave this camp without finding this, this glimmer of hope and freedom because I promise it is there for you. And the joy that comes with it, the joy of his salvation is waiting. And I know that there are lots of you in here that don't feel that joy right now. I know because I've heard it. He wants you. He is pursuing you. You do not have to hide anymore. So please sing your heart out, cry your heart out, pray your heart out. Just make yourself known and speak freely because that is what home is. So please, just, just go home. Go be with him. Go be with someone else. He wants that freedom and he wants that joy for you so badly. You don't have to do anything to get it. 
It's just there. Go find it. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, for your grace, for your mercy, for this freedom that is just beyond any definition and any words that we can even possibly come up with, God. God, what you did when you sent your son to die for us, nothing can replace that. There's, there's no words for it, God. Just grace. That's the best we can come up with, and it's amazing. It's amazing, God. I pray for every broken spirit in this, in this room, whether it's been broken by someone else, whether there's been a betrayal, whether it's a sin or a secret or whatever it is that is causing someone to be weighed down. God, I just pray freedom from that. I pray protection over every heart in this room and over every mind, that they will not hear the lies that, that it is too bad to talk about. It's not too bad. God, you redeem everything. You are not a God of anger who is gonna to crush our, the things that we love, but instead you pursue us and you want us to come home and take refuge in you, God, and you want us to take refuge in each other. We get to carry each other's burdens. We thank you for that privilege. So God, I just pray for all of these things, these weights that we carry on our spirits to be bound up tonight, God. Bound up and cast far away. Cleanse us, God. Restore us. And help us, God, to show others this incredible, beautiful love that you give us. So the world that needs to know you will know you through the work you do in us. I pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Just sing that again. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you.
Just take a moment for yourself right now. Let's just take a moment for yourself. Just meditate right now. Hey guys, I just wanted to drop in and uh, and say that um, you know, I say it all the time that God is obviously moving in this place, but His presence is no more thicker here than it is where you are. It's no more evident. It's no stronger. God is everywhere, and He's all knowing and all powerful and all loving. I just pray for you right now, as as you've been listening to this. How is it that God would have you respond? And sure, you might be by yourself, but I just wanted to bring it home that this is not uh, just a, a spectator thing that you might just be watching, but perhaps God is speaking to you right now. It doesn't need to be uh, like you're going to miss this moment because you're by yourself at home. Uh, if you are watching but not in the chat room, then you could come in the chat room and uh, you could share what's going on for you. We could also do some uh, one-on-one. You can click uh, you can click on my name, Grant Whitehead, and uh, I'd love to chat with you one-on-one. And there's Bev Whitehead as well. Um, and uh, you could chat there too. We're going to come back to singing. I just want you to know that God is active and He is working in your life no matter where you are whether you're with people or not. Um, as, we, as we sing this song, may this be an opportunity of response for you as you listen to God. God, speak to our people, speak to people no matter where they are right now. God, we are listening. Thank you, Jesus. Lord of Lord. Sing that 
continue in an attitude of prayer because God is still doing work. God still wants to hear your story. The truth is, Anne-Marie, all of us have a story. 
Thank you for giving the gift of sharing yours first. And now God wants to hear yours. It's not a matter of time. It's not a matter of what comes next. It's a matter of getting God back into your home and sharing what's heavy on your heart. We don't need to wrap it up. We don't need to get going. We need to get on our knees. We need to pray for our children. We need to pray for our young people. We need to pray for each other because we're all in this together. We all have a story. We all have a hurt. We all have shame. And we all need to tell God about it so we can come home. I'm going to ask Anne-Marie to come up. And we're going to be sensitive to those who are still cleaning up their home. Because we all need to clean our homes. And I'm going to pray for Anne-Marie. But Anne-Marie, before I do that, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being a servant that comes to teach us about cleaning, restoring, and giving us a gift that is not easy to give, but is well worth it. And we thank you for that. Let's pray for Anne-Marie. God, we thank you so much for this willing spirit to come and to, to come in front of us. And to give us the gift of going first. God, telling us things that many of us struggle with. We all have a story, God. We all have pain. We all have shame. But we all, all have a God who is ready to cleanse us, to redeem us, and to free us. And God, we thank you for giving us the example through Anne-Marie of that clear vision of freedom in you. So God, I pray right now, if there's still somebody out there, if there's still one soul that's just not sure if they want to share, God, that you would break them right now. That you would break that bond that the evil one wants to keep on them. God, would you break that now? Would you allow them to come and to receive the cleansing, to receive your Holy Spirit, to receive the freedom of shame, the freedom of bondage. God, we thank you so much for Anne-Marie and her word to us tonight, but more importantly, we thank you for your work through her and the healing that you've given her and the healing that you've shown that we also can experience. God, we pray right now that you would continue to bless her as she travels home. We continue to pray for her as she speaks to many people out there that they would hear the story just as powerfully as we have. God, we thank you for her gentle spirit. But more importantly, we thank you for her obedience to you. And now, God, would you bless her? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend.
that you guys not sleep for three days before you come because you sing so much louder and get a little looser. It's good. Um, divisional debrief will follow this. Uh, why don't you just go to it straight because you get more time in a snack shop that's called the snack shop. Van Key. Someone has lost a Van Key from the Del Oro Division. If, you've, if you found it, it's for a minivan. Um, those that are flying out tomorrow, uh, if you are flying out tomorrow, well, everybody, we'd like for your stuff to be out of the rooms um, before breakfast and uh, help out Mount Hermon. They have a massive group coming in this week, and so uh, I think we could help them out by uh, getting out right, at, right before breakfast. If you haven't been to breakfast, it's in the dining hall. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. And uh, you'll bring your stuff down to the multi-purpose room. The lights are on over there. You'll bring your stuff down there and that will be staged there till after the meeting. Now, if you're flying to uh, La Quinta Hotel, which you would actually be driving to, then flying away, you will take your stuff and bring it to Youth Memorial. Um, if you are interested in the marriage retreat that uh, Jim and Doug were talking about, um, as soon as they give me the discount code, they're going to email me the discount code. I'll be sending that to all you guys uh, to sign up. Uh, again, I think he said 50 couples uh, that would be available, and that's in March in Azusa Pacific. Don't sign up if you are not going to attend or you're not sure you're going to attend because it is limited to 50, and I would hate for... Um, one of those free opportunities to be missed because you, you took it and you didn't go. Does that make sense? Sweet. 
Um, Service Corps applications. All right, if you have young people that are uh, mulling over the Service Corps, uh, have them turn those applications. Their deadline is very soon. And uh, make sure that those get sent in. Uh, we're not taking late applications. We get enough as it is. So uh, get them in on time. Uh, WMI will be at Pine Summit. Uh, WMI, if you don't know, is a uh, is the Western Music Institute. It'll be at Pine Summit. That'll be the second week of August, and that is for the ages 14 to. <laughs> wow, that was kind of fun. 14 to 25. We'll go there, right? Oh, wait, 14 to 45. They weren't kidding. 14 to 45. <laughs> I might be able to win the base pin again. Uh, WYI will be taking place at Camp Redwood Glen down the street. And that is for, uh, it's, a, it's a Bible camp for 16 to 25-year-olds. So uh, you get more information from your DC, DYSs and the DCs. I'm in with them. Uh, <laughs> Right now, we're going to do lucky seat. Check underneath your uh, pew. There's free stuff underneath there. I'm just kidding. When you say free in the Salvation Army, people move. It's so crazy. We gave away books from 1972 today. I, I mean, that was crazy. People were like, oh, this is so wonderful. It was published in 1972. It's not even correct anymore. <laughs> but it's free. Um, what a blessing it was to have Amory Miller with us tonight. And uh, Anne is uh, Amory is just a, a great communicator. But uh, she's an she's an incredible author and writer. And uh, she has books back there um, outside uh, the sliding glass doors uh, to for sale. Um, why don't we just do her a favor and, and just buy them all up so she doesn't have to take them back to Nashville, all right? So uh, feel free to get those back there. Have a good night, everyone. Well, that is the end of the uh, the end of the last night session from boot camp. So uh, there's still another morning session to go with Colonel Dave Hudson, who's been doing uh, a series. It'll be the fourth in uh, the series about the prodigal son. Uh, has been really, really good. Uh, his uh, sermon series uh, in the mornings, and so you could catch up. You've got enough time between now and then because it's about 12 hours away you could watch all three sessions they're available on YouTube uh, you can see them all uh, all there um, but uh, you can join us it'll be at 9am we'll come on a little bit early perhaps and uh, and make sure everyone's working with the stream and that sort of thing um, but that will be in 12 hours time that'll be the last session of boot camp but uh let me tell you that th this coming Tuesday night, we have a thing called Gospel Stories, which is a Bible discussion, uh, live webcast from Long Beach, California. We do it with uh, uh, a few other people, Major Rhonda Gilger and uh, Major Kevin Jackson and Major Brian Birchall uh, and myself. We sit down and we focus in on one particular Gospel story um, that comes from Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. Uh, sometimes all of them, the same story appears. And uh, we have the chat room um, who are asking questions and making comments and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, it's a great way to just I experience and challenge your thinking about uh, particular gospel stories. And so uh, it, that's at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday night. Uh, most Tuesday nights we do it. And so I hope that you can join us for that. Um, the next main event that will be live streaming will be the Creative Arts Camp. It's called something else. It is Creative Arts. Creative Ministry Camp. <laughs> One of those. You get the idea. It's, uh, it's at Camp Redwood Glen 
and it's over a weekend. Uh, uh, Phil Lager, uh, worship leader extraordinaire, will be coming over. He'll be the guest. Uh, I think I believe he's doing a concert on the Friday night, which uh, would be excited to live stream. So we'll be live streaming uh, those all those sessions as well. That's uh, mid February. Uh, so that's the next thing. But between that now and then, uh, we'll have gospel stories each week. So um, um, there's plenty of things happening on, on uh, Online Core. Uh, something that I recorded today was a live stories. We haven't done a live stories episode for a while. Um, but uh, I did a live stories with Major Rob Burks. Uh, and it was a really great discussion. Uh, we walked through his life and... Uh, uh, just just really interesting really genuine um a couple of the teary moments uh which you which proves that it's genuine right the emotion uh was there and uh, just a really relaxed conversation that we had as we walked through um the the highs and lows of life um and so i'll be posting that uh, possibly next week uh and then there's a chapel service as well uh uh lieutenant colonel dusty hill edward hill uh did the chapel service last week and we will be posting that next week <laughs> so there's all that and then there's lots of of uh all the events we're building more and more videos all the time we've got 200 over 250 videos on youtube uh from online course 60 of those are gospel stories so um there's plenty to look at I'm just going to double check, uh, make sure we've got, yeah, we've got a few people that, are, that joined us. So we're really glad that you did. Um, I want to pray as uh, we finish our, our time together. Um, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you've been active in this room and you've been active in the rooms of people that have been watching online. We thank you that uh, you um, uh, are guiding us and you're speaking to us. And God, we just pray. Uh, we pray for the, each individual that's at home right now, wherever they are as they're watching, um, that you would just give a peace that transcends understanding, take away burdens and heavy questions, uh, but uh, just give a peace that means for good rest uh, and divine appointments. God, we, we ask uh, for the phone to ring at that right time with the right person. And... Uh, and, and and as we meet different people as well, that there would be something about it which was that you are involved and that we would recognize that. God, we just, we just thank you that, uh, that you're a loving God and that we don't need to do life alone. Uh, we are connected with you and connected with other people that believe in you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, there you go. I don't really want to say goodbye. That's one of the things uh, with with doing these uh, live streaming of live events, of events, um, and that was that I, I noticed when I used to watch events that uh, the last song would play, they'd say goodnight, and inevitably it would be a fade to black and that was it. And uh, And so even just even just what we do now as just saying, just acknowledging that you are watching um, and that you're a part of what's been happening here, um, I think helps. Because people, people are standing around now, you know, you see here. Oh, actually the camera's turned off. <laughs> you, you would see here that people are standing around and debriefing and having a chat. And so at least this is some way towards that to help you sort of get as best an, an experience as possible. Um, and so that's the idea. And then if you come on early enough tonight, we had amazing, I got to interview uh, Anne-Marie Miller. I uh, got to talk to her for a while. And then also um, I'm, I just met a random couple um, where the guy has only been a Christian for a year. Uh, and uh, it was an amazing story. <laughs> so we try to do that as well, where it feels like you get a real experience of what it would be like to be here because you get to talk to different people. And so that's the idea. And there's lots of events that are happening this year. Um, we've, we've got lots. Uh, um, uh, Jim Sparks, I'm trying to remember his name. Jim Sparks was just mentioning um, WYI, there's some people. WYI and uh, um, WMI uh, are two events. W, the, 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 um, the Western Youth Institute 
we will be live streaming all those sessions. The music, uh, Western Music Institute, we, we live stream the concert. Um, and so that you get to see what uh, all those guys have been up to during that time because it's actually at the same or overlaps um, those events at the same time. And then there's the Western Bible Conference. Um, it's another event that's at Pine Summit. And uh, that's, that was brilliant last year and only expecting uh, more this year. Uh, and so we'll live stream all of that. And then there's commissioning where uh, new officers um, are commissioned and appointed and ordained and sent out. And so that's always a big event. And actually, uh, there's an Amy Grant concert, which I'm pretty certain we won't be able to live stream, but we'll be asking that question. <laughs> that's on the Friday night of commissioning. There's lots of there's seriously lots of events which I actually it's really exciting because it means that we get to uh, live stream and uh, and build the community at Online Core and um, the more the better I think except that I miss my wife and kids so I'm looking forward to seeing them. <laughs> well, no one wants to chat to me in the chat room, but there are still a few people watching. You still listening to what I'm saying? It's like radio. <laughs> I know, except, except with this, I at least know that there are people watching, whereas radio, you're not exactly sure that people are listening. I got to do radio when I was, uh, when I was uh, in high school. It was fun. <laughs> oh, there we go, Terry. Thanks for allowing those of us who can't be there to share in the teaching and fellowship. You are very, very welcome, Terry. I'm going to have a quick look and see where Terry is from. Terry is from... It's coming up. From Grand Junction, Colorado. Nice. Well, I'm glad that you could join in, Terry. Well, thank you, friends. I'm going to say good night now. And you know how I was talking before about the fate to black? Unfortunately, there still has to be an end to a live webcast. And here it comes. <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>